Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at reading and writing in the first century, part of our class on New Testament backgrounds. To go back to the history of writing, writing in antiquity starts earlier than 3000 BC. This is an example written on a clay tablet. You can see a symbol for a human head. And in front of it, front of him, there's a, a separate symbol. This is a symbol for human bread. Um, and you say, well, is the bread eating? You know, is it uh, where they're put together? What does it mean? I'll leave that for other experts. I, I, you know, have not learned how to read this very early form. But we find tablets like this, and it begins to grow. It's not long in Egypt before you have the hieroglyphs. Now, hieroglyphs, when they were first uh, seen, they were thought maybe they were some sort of picture writing, uh, where uh, for example, you have a picture of a bird. We must be talking about birds. No, that's not the case at all. Instead, the hieroglyphs, uh, each glyph stood for a certain sound, almost like a syllable. Uh, and you need quite a number, quite a large number, actually, of hieroglyphs in order to uh, make sense of words. And, and then uh, you might want to spell that, them out more specifically. Meanwhile, in Mesopotamia, writing had evolved into what's called cuneiform, uh, these uh, notices uh, made of clay, hardened clay, and you take a cuneus, a wedge-shaped stick, and press it into the clay to make these wedge shapes, um, hence the, the term cuneiform. And you need a, I don't know, uh, over a hundred, maybe a couple of hundred different characters in order to write with that. Some languages you need even more. But a real breakthrough came when somebody invented the alphabet. It used to be thought that the Phoenicians came up with the alphabet, and then we, came, we found one that's markedly earlier, a few hundred years earlier, coming from the Sinai Peninsula. And that's, that's intriguing, because in the Bible we read of Moses and the Israelites uh, coming out of Egypt, and they're in the Sinai. This, now, the writing uh, that they found seems to, to, seems to have been uh, put there uh, a few generations, maybe 100 or 200 years before Moses, depending on exactly where we put the Exodus. And so we had Proto-Canaanite. I'm going to look at just a few letters. Uh, um, notice, uh, and I'm going to uh, look at the Hebrew and the Greek. In the Hebrew, we refer to that as Aleph. In Greek, uh, Alpha. You know, in fact, we refer to our alphabet. Notice it began as sort of a stylized picture, maybe of an ox. And then the Greek, he just sort of turned that uh, on its on its head. You can still see the the two horns if you use your imagination. And indeed, in Canaanite Alf or in in Hebrew, uh, Aleph is the word for ox. And so it, you can sort of see where uh, the the idea for the letter comes. You know, in English, sometimes when we're teaching English, we say A is for apple. They would have said uh, Aleph is for ox because it was that word. Um, in Let's go to another letter. This is B, or, or um, in Hebrew, you say uh, Bet. Uh, in, in Greek, you say Beta. Uh, a Bet is a house in Hebrew. Uh, same thing in Canaanite. And notice the very uh, early Canaanite way that you wrote this, you actually drew sort of a stylized picture of a house. Um, Gimel, I'm not, that might be a little uh, harder to, uh, to uh, render. In early Canaanite, um, uh, a gamel it was a throw stick. In Hebrew, a gimel is a camel. Sounds a little bit like our word for camel. Uh, Greek, they just say gamma. Um, and so notice in some cases, the, both the, the letter but also the way it's pronounced moved from language to language. Even though from Hebrew to Greek, there's a great deal of difference. Those are not two related languages. We'll look at a few more. Uh, here's a, uh, a daleth, uh, if I'm speaking Hebrew, a delta, if I'm speaking Greek, um, a dig, if I'm speaking Canaanite, um, and the word for uh, dig in, in Canaanite um, refers to a fish. Um, in fact, the Philistines, they, they had a god named Dagon. And because of that, people thought, well, maybe it was some sort of fish god. It wasn't <laughs> because they weren't speaking Kenyan. They were speaking some other language. Um, but uh, you see um, where some of these ideas have come around. Uh, a few more letters will suffice. A mem in, is, in Hebrew is the word for, for water. In Greek, you would say mu. Uh, 
Um, and if you use your imagination, you can see, well, gee, that looks a little bit like waves, the way the Canaanites have, have uh, written it, have, uh, have drawn it. Uh, notice that most of these Canaanite symbols are rather straight because when you're, when you're carving, it's rather difficult to make a curved line, so it's much easier to make a straight line. Uh, and yet, sometimes you do what you have to do. An ayin in Hebrew is uh, an eye. Uh, notice the proto-Canaanite uh, ayin uh, actually looks a bit like an eye. Hebrew, not so much, uh, the, these later Hebrew Aramaic letters. So what we have is three major language families, and this is reflected in the book of Genesis, where you have Indo-European, reminds me a little bit of, of Japheth and those that are said to have descended from him, uh, the Semitic uh, uh, relating to Shem, and Hamitic, uh, those in, in Central and as you move south into Africa. Now, by the time we get to the New Testament, things have changed somewhat. So that there were great many languages by now that had formed, but in the New Testament world, there were three major languages, three primary languages. Uh, in, of course, in Rome, uh, that's a Latin country, and so the Latin uh, language was spoken in those areas that had impacted Rome, both uh, Italy and south in Carthage, which had been overcome by the Romans, but by now they had rebuilt the city. And, and so North Africa, they were all Latin speakers as well. We go over to Greece, but not just in Greece, in Anatolia, and also south down into Egypt, because Egypt had been ruled for hundreds of years by Greek, uh, descent, Greek descendants of Alexander's generals. And so um, the primary language in that area was, was Greek, and that would extend even over into, into places like Jerusalem, although uh, perhaps a more common language for them would have been Aramaic. And so these three, Latin, notice I, I put Greek in very big letters because um, you, could, you could hear Greek spoken in Rome. Uh, Latin would, might be the primary language, but all educated people uh, spoke Greek as well. And you could hear Greek spoken in Jerusalem, and you could hear Greek spoken even further to the east. Uh, but Aramaic was a very old and uh, distinguished language. Um, remember, the capital of Aram was Damascus. Damascus wasn't so important of a city by this time, but the Aramaic language still had made itself known. Now let's talk about writing materials, the, the, the materials on which you write. Um, very early in human history, you have monumental, monumental inscriptions, uh, inscriptions placed on monuments. And this is true in the New Testament era, too. Here's a, um, a uh, part of a wall from Philippi, and uh, you're reading uh, in Greek. In fact, you can, if you look down on the bottom line, you can make out the word Macedon. Uh, and so um, here's a part of the monument of one of the official buildings. Next, we have ostraca. Now, an ostraca is a broken piece of pottery. Um, and you see, they, the writing materials could be very expensive, but if you have a pot, and oops, I dropped it, and I just broke my pot, uh, instead of throwing those pieces away, you would gather them up and save them and perhaps use them as scrap paper, or not just scrap paper. Uh, sometimes you might even find something rather official like a marriage covenant or a divorce covenant, uh, a, a bill of divorce that would be written on a piece of ostraca. Um, and, and here's an example. Here's uh, Aristides uh, Lysimato. Um, and so here's somebody's name. Sort of reminds me that in, in uh, er, very early in Greece, uh, they would... They, didn't, they were always very conscious about maybe having uh, somebody become too powerful. And so in Athens in particular, they would take a vote to see who was the most popular person, that person that might be, become so popular that he would, he would take over the reins of government. And they would vote on pieces of ostraca, and whoever won the vote would be ostracized. That's a term that we use today. Um, and by that, he meant, we meant that he would be banished for a period of years, ostracized, uh, because his name had the most, uh, had appeared on the most ostraca. And so we have a number of uh, different ostraca that have been found all over the New Testament world um, in, in all sorts of languages. If you wanted to get more 
uh, perhaps more permanent because Ostraca, after all, it's broken pottery. Uh, a invention that had been developed in Egypt was that which used the papyri plant. And here we're driving through uh, the Nile Delta, and I just leaned out the window and snapped a quick picture of some of the papyri plants, some of the marsh plants that grow in the Delta. Uh, these days, I understand that papyri is actually becoming a bit more rare in Egypt, but, but at the time it was, they were, it was plentiful, especially in this region of the Delta. What you would do is you'd take the, the stalk of the plant and you would cut the stalks, uh, slice them evenly, and then you would uh, skin them and, and place them in flat areas so that they formed sort of a, a checkerboard. So uh, one row and then a cross-section row. And then you would take some sort of hard, smooth object, maybe a stone, and just smash it all together and uh, until it's sort of a gooey, uh, plastered mess together. And then you would let it dry out in the sun for maybe a week, and it would turn... Uh, a deeper shade of brown, and uh, once it was cured, you could write on it. Now, it had two sides. It had the smooth side <laughs> and the rough side. The smooth side, scribes really liked to write on that, on that side. In a pinch, if they had to, then they might write on both sides, both the smooth and the rough side, but that wasn't really optimum. So here's some examples of papyri, and indeed, our earliest copies of the New Testament are written on papyri. Some, in fact, our very earliest copy is a copy of, from the Gospel of John is written on papyri on both sides. So uh, here the scribe wanted to, you know, after all, even, even a single page of papyri takes a bit of labor to put together. You just don't go to your local store and, and purchase a ream of paper. Each page has to be hand prepared, and therefore it represents a significant investment. Notice also uh, in this writing that there's no spaces between the words, or very few. Um, they all sort of run together. Those are not really long words. Uh, um, you, can, you can make, uh, and this start, actually starts off, the epistle uh, of Peter, the second, the second epistle of Peter, and then it goes on from there. Next, we have libraries coming together. And one of your early libraries, it's not the first, you had libraries in the Old Testament era, but Ptolemy I, who had the nickname Soter, Ptolemy the Savior, he was the, one of the generals of Alexander the Great, who, after Alexander died, uh, grabbed for himself uh, Alexandria and Egypt, and he made Alexandria his capital. In fact, he actually brought the, uh, the corpse of Alexander the Great to rest here. And it was his son, Ale uh, Ptolemy II, who built an, a library here at Alexandria. It was a fabulous place, and, and the Ptolemies set out to try to obtain every book that had ever been written, including, including the Hebrew Bible, which led to the translation, because the Ptolemies, they couldn't read uh, actually, they couldn't even read Egyptian, let alone Hebrew. Uh, they were Greek speakers, uh, and they never did learn the, the, he, the Egyptian language. Um, but they had the, the Old Testament scriptures translated into Greek, and that became known as the Septuagint um, because supposedly there were 70 translators that worked on it, and Septus is the Greek word for 70. Actually, it's Latin for 70, but it has that idea. It is said that any ship that sailed into the harbor of Alexandria would be searched not for drugs or contraband, but for, for scrolls, for books. And if any were found, they would be confiscated, they would be taken to the library, they would be copied, and then the copies were given back to the original owners, whereas the originals were left in the library. And the library became uh, the one of the wonders of the of the ancient world. Not to be outdone, uh, at the city of Pergamum, you have uh, Eumenes the second. He's from the Attalid dynasty, um, and uh, he decides to form a library as well. And it's not long before the library at Pergamum is got. Uh, uh, not just hundreds, but thousands and ten and, and perhaps up to a hundred thousand or more uh, 
manuscripts. When I say manuscripts, uh, a manuscript is a, a writing uh, that's done by hand. In Latin, the word manu is uh, hand, and scriptus obviously sounds like to write something. And so it's something that is handwritten. And of course, they didn't have the printing press. Uh, all writing is going to be basically handwritten. Well, uh, Alexandria and Pergamum now have the two major libraries in the world, uh, and Eumenes II is is trying to to maybe outdo the Library of Alexandria, and the Ptolemies didn't care for that, and so they actually place an embargo on the uh, on the um, shipping out of, of papyri. No more papyri, and suddenly, suddenly, per- uh, suddenly Pergamum does not have uh, papyri on which to make copies. And so they moved to a different, I don't know if it was a brand new invented, but it was quite a bit more expensive. And that's parchment. In fact, the word parchment sounds a little bit, uh, you can hear the par, pergamum and par. Uh, supposedly that's where it gets its name from, uh, at least uh, at least the, the term we call it. They, they call it something else in Greek and in other languages. But a parchment now begins to be used. Now, parchment is, uh, involves the use of animal skins, which means that to get parchment, you have to take an animal and you have to kill it. And then on each side of the animal, on its right side and on its left side, you, you take the skin off and that becomes your parchment. Uh, so you can use sheep, you can use goats, you can use calves. And not all of these are, uh, they're not equal. Uh, some are better than others. Uh, it tends to be a bit rough in quality. Um, and so eventually you have vellum. Now, vellum is a French term uh, originally described only calfskin, um, which was a higher form of parchment. In other words, it was a more, a, a more textured and, and smoother and much easier to write on. But eventually the term vellum has become to be used of any sort of finer lighter quality skin, uh, whatever that might be. And, and they have they have found parchments even, actually they found parchment in the Dead Sea Scrolls. I think there was one with camel skin. Um, and so a variety that have been used. And so um, in, in Pergamum, they had to switch more to leave papyri behind. And that worked out okay because you see papyri works great in a dry climate, like in Egypt. Egypt is a desert area. Even though they have the Nile River going through, the the, the area is desert. It hardly ever rains. Um, but in other places where rain is a lot more prevalent, then parchment is going to weather uh, much better. Now, in 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 13, Paul is writing to Timothy. This is at the end of his life. He's in Rome, and he's asking Timothy, when you come, bring the cloak, which I left at Troas with Carpus, and the books, and uh, the Greek word for books there is biblia, that's the, uh, the plural of biblion, um, and it's where we get our word Bible, but don't think necessarily bound books, because this is the same term that would be used to describe scrolls. But then he says, uh, notice the books, you could translate that the scrolls, but especially the parchments. And here it's the Greek word uh, membranas. In fact, you can uh, hear that and it sounds a little bit like membrane or skins. And, and that's the idea behind it. So you have the, the scrolls, which might have been, I don't know if they were made of, of animal skins too. They, they could have been, or if they could have been made of papyri. Uh, but also the, the, the skins, the parchments, those on which you write. And uh, you say, well, uh, were both of these containing writings? Perhaps, or perhaps the, the Biblia, the scrolls, were things that had been written, and maybe the parchments were, were ready to be written because Paul has some writing to do. I don't know if that's the case or not. Um, but uh, he calls for both of these. Now, scrolls are, um, they're easy to store. You roll them up and you can put them into a little niche and had been used and were still very popular in the New Testament era. But the problem with the scroll 
is if you're reading through it, and it's nice because you can you can put it down and it saves your place. But on the other hand, if you say, wait a minute, I want to go back and look at something earlier. Well, you have to unwind it and and s- sort of scroll your way back, and it, it can take some time. But a new invention came about just prior to the first century. Uh, it really hadn't caught on yet. And this was the codex. And a codex uh, takes the pages and binds them on one end, sort of what we would think of as a book. Uh, we have Julius Caesar, who actually seems to have taken, I think he took papyri and uh, just had it bound on one side uh, to use for his study notes and things like this, because remember, he, he was going to write a book, uh, His Gallic Wars. Um, now, I'm not saying it caught on at that point. In fact, uh, throughout the first century and for the next couple of hundred years, uh, people were using scrolls, even though they had codex, but there was one popular exception. It wasn't the only exception. There were a number. But the Christians seem to have a special delight, a special affinity for the Codex. And we have found our earliest manuscripts uh, in this Codex form, both with papyri, although papyri uh, can get a little bit brittle. And so it's fine to fold it in the scroll. There's no sharp edges, but you might end up with some sharp edges when it is in a a codex. And so uh, the parchments, and especially the vellum, are given over to uh, to much better use when it comes to, to binding them in a codex. The Christians seem to have gravitated toward the codex early on, maybe even setting a standard. I, it might be too much to say that if it weren't for the Christians, that we might not have books today. Uh, that might be an overstatement. But it became popular for them. I think perhaps one reason for this is because now they could flip back and forth. They could say, wait, wait a minute, here, here uh, is where Jesus said this, but let's go back a few chapters to see where he said something about this and, and comparing one passage with another. And so we find codexes among the Christians, both, both in the New Testament, but also where they would make copies of the Old Testament and some of our uh, some of our early codexes go back to the Septuagint, which had now been placed, and both the Septuagint and the New Testament placed together into one complete Bible. Finally, I want to talk about literacy. You see, when we think of literacy, you think of the ability to read and to write. Um, but in the New Testament world, these did not necessarily go together. A great many people learned how to read. I, could, I think I could still safely say that the, the majority of, of people in that part of the world did not read. I think literacy was quite a bit higher among the Jewish people because they had been, up to this point, people of the book. And so they had been, in one sense, driven by their beliefs to learn to read. And, and quite a number of Jewish people had learned, indeed, learned how to read so that it was customary in the synagogue. A copy of the, of the scriptures would be brought out, and somebody would be asked to read, which meant that there was at least a few people there that were able to, that were able to read. That does not mean they were able to write, because writing materials were so expensive, it took uh, uh, quite a bit of, uh, of money to train somebody to write. You had to have all the writing materials on which they had to practice. Uh, of course, they could use uh, uh, ostraca, uh, if they if they needed to, or maybe a clay tablet. Um, but writing was normally only the purview of the scribe, whereas quite a few more people could read. You remember how Paul will talk about uh, in at the end of his epistle to the Galatians. He'll say, uh, "You see, with what large letters I'm writing my name," and. Uh, People thought, well, gee, is that because maybe he's blind and he can't see very well? Uh, possibly because he wasn't in the habit of writing. He was able to read just fine, but writing, normally he would use a secretary, an amanuensis, who would, who would uh, copy his words and write them out. And we know from the New Testament, sometimes, um, for example, in Romans, uh, his, his scribe, his amanuensis, actually says, hey, uh, uh, I'm Tertius, I'm, I'm writing this to you, uh, and I just wanted to say hi. <laughs> and then he continues with the words of Paul. 
And so in, in literacy, we had pe- lots of people reading, not quite so many people able to write. 